having it isn't that big of a hardship, whereas having it, it means I'm going to, my arthritis is going to get worse. It's not worth it. Yeah. So for me, I've got the incentive. I know it, it talk about people like with diabetes and stuff like that. I would think that would be an incentive. I mean, I know what that's like, but I, I've heard enough about it to know that it's probably not very much fun. Oh. Um, so, you know, I don't know what it takes. I know what it took for me to make the switch. And that, you know, it was something near and dear to my heart that I needed. Um, but once I decided to do it, it just hasn't been tough. It, I mean, the juices are great. And uh, even the green juice tastes good. Mm -hmm. Throw a little apple and everything tastes good. Oh, yeah. And, you know, yeah. I mean, I was doing the carrot juice without the apple, and then Amelia told me to add the apple, and it's like, whoa, this is like a whole other world. I mean, it's, it's yeah. delicious. So, I mean, I pretty much look forward to what I'm going to eat, and I'm eating, you know, six times a day, you know, between the juice and the juice. And then uh, apples, oranges, and bananas in between, and I'm a happy camper. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Eat Real to Heal podcast. It has been a wonderful few years of hosting this podcast, and I am so excited for what is coming up ahead. We have a few more podcasts with incredible guests like this podcast today with musician Bob Goldstick, who reversed his arthritis at 86 years old. We have Cheryl Mum, who has been able to reverse so many of her symptoms of MS and go from being housebound for the last five years to moving about the community, going to concerts, and her husband can't even keep up with her now. So you're going to hear that podcast coming out in a few weeks. And then, of course, we have another wonderful podcast with John Lewis coming up. Uh, he's a basketball player and he has the beautiful documentary, which everyone must see. Um, and we're going to be talking about that, the documentary, They're Trying to Kill Us, a wonderful book that's coming out as well. So he'll be coming out in three weeks. And then after that, we have a podcast series. And that is a podcast series that has come out of my PhD research for the last seven years. Um, and you're going to be listening to nine podcasts for, with traditional knowledge holders, experts in the field of health and wellness and metabolic nutrition and detoxification. And you're going to get to hear those incredible podcasts where you really get to see the blatant racism, oppression, uh, sexism, ageism that is currently in place in our United States and Canadian uh, medical systems. And you're going to hear about all the barriers that exist that prevent people of color, Black, Indigenous, Asian, South Asian um, individuals, people with disabilities that prevent them from being able to access the quality of foods that we talk about all the time on this program. If you have a chronic disease and you want to reverse your chronic disease, it requires 100% organic, nutrient-dense food. And I can tell you right now, 90% of the food that is grown in the United States and Canada is not nutrient-dense, and it is full of pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, and other chemicals that our bodies do not need and cannot tolerate. So if you want to reverse a chronic disease, putting more toxins into your body is not going to help. Putting food that's not nutrient dense and that's refined and processed is not going to help you reverse that chronic disease. So stay tuned for that wonderful podcast series that is going to be coming up. But for today, let us jump into Bob Goldstick's podcast. So Bob is an incredibly talented pianist and musician with a career spanning over 70 years. He went from playing in high school dances to Hollywood musicals, piano bars in major cities, and he has been showcased in various genres, including jazz, classical, and rock and roll. His greatest joys come from entertaining elders in convalescent hospitals and retirement homes. And this is where he has performed over 1,500 shows since 1993. But like what happens to so many people is they get older and they haven't been living a nutrient-dense lifestyle or perhaps there's a lot of toxicity brought into their bodies and their lives. Well, he developed arthritis, which prevented him from playing. However, his daughter 
Amelia Rain, who works for us full time, she reversed her Graves disease, um, uh, goiter, uh, hyperthyroidism, and he watched her do that. And then he wondered, you know, could I reverse my arthritis that's preventing me from playing music that has really put, like, really ended his career? And that is exactly what Bob did. So we are going to dive into this podcast where you get to learn all about the barriers that Bob had to overcome, the mental, emotional barriers that he had to come in doing the Eat Real to Heal program. You're going to learn how he went from a former chemistry engineer to musician and what that was like, uh, how he lived in intentional communities, how he's become a healing hero and how he overcame his preconceived notions that otherwise were preventing him from reversing his chronic diseases until his daughter, Amelia, did that. So let's dive in. And before we, you know, launch this episode with Bob Goldstick, if you are interested in becoming a metabolic nutrition and detox certified coach, so that means you are going to do the work that I do in helping people reverse their chronic diseases. If you want to learn the science of that and how to launch a business, we have a six month training program where the first three months is dedicated to the science of reversing chronic diseases. And the last three programs are dedicated to you taking all of that knowledge or certification and launching a successful career like so many of our other students have done. We have students now that own wellness centers on 169 acres of land. That's as and wellness that Shelby Friesen owns with his business partners, working with men who have mental health conditions, working with indigenous communities and elders to bring that traditional knowledge to these individuals who have mental health disorders on beautiful land, or perhaps you're going to open up a couple restaurants uh, like Angela and Chris have done or start a salad delivery company like Rosa did. So many of our students are just doing some of the most incredible things. So if you want to learn how to become a metabolic nutrition and detox certified coach, please check out the links below and sign up or book a call with me today so that you can learn more about the program. And without further ado, let's jump into this podcast with Bob Goldstick. Thanks everyone for listening to our podcast and sharing them with others. Thanks to Becky Dalziel for being our um. Becky DL. Oh, Becky, you have an incredible, beautiful last name that always, always stumps me. Um, Becky, um, and, and apologies for getting that wrong. Uh, but Becky has been uh, editing our podcast for so long. And thank you for the work that you do. And again, thanks to our audience for being here. Let's dive in now. So hi, everyone, and welcome to the Eat Real to Heal podcast. I am your host, Nicolette Riche, and on today's podcast, I'm so excited to have Bob Goldstick. He is the father of one of our incredible team members here at Richer Health in the Green Mustache. She's amazing. And she introduced me to her dad, who I'm meeting here for the first time today. So welcome, Bob, to our show. Thank you. So as I was saying, you know, Amelia, she uh, she has an incredible story. It, it, her own healing journey has been amazing, um, you know, in dealing with her own health issues and which then led to, and we'll get into this, how you ended up doing our program and are still doing. And so we're going to get into that in a little bit as well, but you have this amazing, fascinating history. And I want to know all about that. So I understand that you are, you were a chemical engineer, correct? Yes. Yeah. And is, and is that something that you wanted to be like right out of high school or why did you decide to be a chemical engineer? You know, I had a chemistry teacher in my first year. I think I signed up originally for mechanical engineering, but I had a chemistry teacher that made an impact and I switched to chemical engineering from, uh, from the mechanical. Amazing. And was that, did, you were so fascinated about chemistry or was it a combination of like, I'm going to make a lot of money in this industry or like, did you have a vision for what you wanted to do with a chemistry degree or was it just pure fascination? No, I think at, at the time it was just, uh, and I've noticed over the years that I just understand chemistry in a way that I don't understand physics and I don't understand electricity and 
And I know these things in a way, but they're not intuitive. Whereas the chemistry was always, I, it just kind of resonated, I guess, in a way. And I always felt that way. It wasn't about the money. It was about, although chemical engineers back then, this was in the early 60s when I did this, uh, they were considered higher priced, you know, higher value than, almost most of the other engineers because it was more complex more you had to learn more so the mechanical engineers and so forth and that kind of carried over during my career i would guess although not later uh it was mostly just something about the chemistry and what i was learning and that was first year so it was real basic but and it, it carried through over in all the jobs that i had there was just a, a, something about it and even now when i talk about it my nephew's a uh, electrical engineer at Boeing, and we talk engineering when we get together a lot. And it's it's obvious that there was something there. I so love I that. Did. Well, I was going to say, I love what you said there. Is that it, you know anything that you do when you learn it, it carries through to all areas of your life. Right. You can never unlearn it. Yeah, yeah. And then you see the world through um, through that subject or through that field of study. I love how that happens. Um, so, but chemical engineering wasn't your only career. You also have this incredible passion for music, not just a passion, but you're also, I heard an incredible pianist as well. Yeah, yeah. I, <clears throat> I have my skills, as a friend <laughs> said, but, um, yeah, I was a chemical engineer for seven years and it, I, I was at mobile oil in New York. And they offered me, I just moved to New York a year or so before. And I loved the city from Philadelphia. And um, they offered me a, um, uh, a transfer to Princeton. They were moving the whole department, uh, software, I was doing software then, uh, to Princeton. And I didn't want to leave New York. So they offered me severance three or four months or something like that. And so I took the severance and I had already pretty much been done with engineering at that point. I was ready to, uh, I would call that my hippie stage. So I started to learn to play guitar because you don't play the piano in the park in those days anyway. And um, I drove a cab. So that, and I did that for about seven years. And then seven years later, Life took me in another direction. I went back to engineering for another seven years. And then in 85, that kind of uh, disappeared. And I started playing piano at a necessity. And I was in Santa Cruz at that point, California. And since then, that's all I've done. Okay, so so you just said you started playing piano uh, out of necessity. Tell me about that. Well, I was in the waste heat recovery business and, and started like in 78 uh, to 85 and, and alternative energy, stuff like that. And by happenstance, I sort of became a star. Uh, I was doing two lectures with for DOE and I learned a certain technique as part of a project and it made me an expert in the field. And so then DOE and EPA, and they would hire me to do seminars and other groups. So I was doing pretty good. I started, I had my own business and uh, the price of oil changed almost overnight from, it, I mean, it, it seems ridiculous now, but it was $28 a barrel then, which was considered very high. Uh, and then the price dropped to $12 a barrel. Uh, which was considered really low. So in my last couple seminars, I was basically showing engineers that they could save money by not buying the equipment to save energy, but put it in the bank because interest rates were through the sky. So all of a sudden I had no work. I also had no business skills. So I wasn't prepared at all. And I was in Santa Cruz at that point uh, and my daughters were with me after a period of not being with me. So I didn't really think I, I wasn't going to leave. And so I started playing piano and started getting gigs. And as they, that's, that was it. Uh, 
just like that. Hey, so <laughs> yeah, just start playing, actually, get gigs, and then that's it. Um, well, yeah. pretty much, you know, one of the stories that I've told many times is that, that my last seminar was at the Sheridan in Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. And I was getting paid $1,000 a day back then. Um, Whoa. And then about five weeks later, I was playing piano on the street. I could see the Sheridan. I, I, I remember that night I made almost nothing, like two or five, ten dollars or something like that, because I didn't quite know the whole routine at that point. And the irony is you know, never left me and, and I wouldn't trade it. I mean, when, even back then, I wouldn't have traded it uh, because, you know, the resonance that I have in engineering and so forth doesn't come close to how it feels when I'm playing piano. So... Yeah, no, this is amazing. And, and just, I love that, you know, you did it out of necessity, um, you know, learning how to play the piano. Uh, the fact, I just want to go back quickly, just in case people didn't quite um, capture what you just told, which is that, you know, here you are, you're a chemical engineer, you're in the energy sector. So the green energy sector, you build a business yeah. where you're teaching people about waste recovery systems, which, and so I was in the green building industry and we were studying like you know geothermal energy and every like all of and right but this is 25 years ago and so you were doing this like what year was that when you 80, were it was between 80 and 85 right and then the and there was huge massive government shift at that point too from what i understand yeah. and there was also a recession and then of course like you said the oil prices dropped so it literally bankrupt anybody who was in the sustainable energy field at that time yep. and here we are today where everybody thinks like oh renewable energy is such a new thing and like sustainable energy concepts and wind energy and all of this is new but it's not like canada the us so many countries were leading the charge in the 70s with these thriving businesses while the oil prices were high and everybody got flattened and decimated yeah yeah that's true yeah. So that's, yeah, you were, that's incredible that you were, and I would never known that if I wasn't in the green building sector and, you know, studying sustainable, you know, the sustainable right. community development at the time. But I just want to reiterate that, that electric cars are new, not a new invention. Wind energy oh. is not a new invention. People had like your family, you know, was dependent on this business thriving in this sector. And then it got demolished right. um, overnight. So thank you for sharing that with us. So here you are. Had you played piano? Like, I know you said you played guitar in the park, but like, had you taken no, any I, piano lessons or? Yeah, no, I started playing piano when I was six. Okay. And, and I studied classical and then I played in high school and in, in rock and roll bands. And, and then in college, I was a jazz band. Um, and then in my, when I, even in my twenties, when I first got married, I would play piano bar occasionally, uh, you know, so I'd work an extra job. And so I would play piano bar back then. So I would, I was always dabbling in playing, you know, um, but I would never, never consider making a living at it at that point because I was an engineer and made good money doing that. Um, it was only after the mobile oil thing that, and th that was seven years later when I had enough of the engineering world and, and changed, but I was already knew how to play the piano. Okay, and, awesome. Uh, yeah, for those Thanks seven for years, I yeah, I didn't play much. I played mostly guitar yeah. and drove a lot of taxis. Right. So I love this. You are you are a human of many trades and skills, and you're willing to do what it takes to make everything work. So at yeah. the time when you you know you said you were um, you had the two girls now, so Amelia and her sister living with you. Um, were you a full time dad now at this time? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here you are, your full-time dad, single dad. And um, did people think you were, you know, losing it to like quit your, this good job or not stay in the industry and switch to playing piano or like, or were you supported by your family and friends? What was that? Well, like for you? no, my, my family, my, my parents thought I was nuts. Uh, my brother, I knew, knew I was nuts. <laughs> So yeah, they, but they weren't in the picture at all. And, mm -hmm. and my kids thought it was great. You know, they, they were all for it. The only job offer I had back then was to go to Florida. 
uh, I could have stayed in the industry and, and it was it was a pretty good money offer, but I they wouldn't have gone. They were teenagers at this point. They were new to back to Santa Cruz. This is where they wanted to live. Uh, I don't I don't even remember talking to them about it because it was off. I couldn't see them going for it. And I didn't really want to do it either. Yeah. So at that point, it was just change of lifestyle. I mean, one of the things I've told my kids, if you want to be a successful musician, you learn to live cheap. Mm. And I was able to switch gears and, and just stop spending money and just making a little bit by playing on the street in Santa Cruz and then started getting gigs um, in my Ray in San Francisco and Carmel. I wound up getting a really good piano board gig in Carmel that I played off and on from 88 to 2000. Wow. So that was one of the mainstays. And then in the 90s, I started playing in nursing homes in 93. So I did that for about till 2010, 2012 as a full-time job. Yeah, I love that because um, I had to I had to call Amelia and be like, give me the lowdown on your dad oh, before boy. I jump into this podcast. Because a lot of our guests, like, I mean, like, you know, they've, um, you know, there's there, you can follow them. I know them. I've been following them for a long time. And so I reach out to them and I say, be on my show. Whereas this was a little bit different. It was Amelia telling me about you. And I'm like, this man's incredible. I don't know anything about him. So she did. She gave me that lowdown that you're like this jazz loving piano playing musician that you, um, you know, you opened for blood, sweat and tears. Well, not personally. We were, I was in the Bay. I was in a, a mime troupe an incredible uh, the, the mind troop and we opened for blood, sweat and tears. Um, it was a, a strange combination. Uh, I had a track basically where three people did the mimes. They were on the stage and uh, they would act out these various uh, scenes that were very different than normal mime. And I would provide the piano playing for the soundtrack. So. It wasn't me opening, it was them opening and I was part of the, the band, but yeah. And so we did that for about five, six months. And yeah, I, I love that Amelia three. said you were very humble and I'm like, well, you were there and you opened alongside the mic. So yeah, you definitely oh, opened yeah. for Blood, Sweat and yeah. Tears. Um, I love that. And then of course, the part that intrigued me is that you got into playing in nursing at homes and retirement communities. And so how did you get into that? And, you know, what led you down that path? Well, it was, it was Amelia, actually. Um, and yeah, this, uh, she told me, I, 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 boy, um, she had gotten a to playing on the street in Santa Cruz. And normally Santa Cruz is, it's fine to play, but every once in a while, uh, it was after the earthquake and they got very uptight about a lot of stuff there. So she had a backpack down, I think, you know, and they gave her a ticket for something, blocking the sidewalk, who knows. <clears throat> she went to court, they gave her community service and the community service was to play music in a nursing home. She didn't have any idea what to do, but she was there and I was going to pick her up one day. So I went to pick her up and she was there playing in the corner like, a, I mean, she was a rock and roller, um, but she didn't think she could play her music for these folks. So she was just kind of what we call noodling around on the guitar, sort of semi-classical, making pretty sounds, but not really anything. Um, but she was making music. And when I came to pick her up, there was a piano there and she said, hey, dad, why don't you play a song? So at that time I was playing at the Mission Ranch and one of the women uh, used to sing, uh, I can't give you anything but love. And that was, you know, her big song and people liked it. And I thought this would be appropriate uh, for the crowd. So I played it. And the reaction was phenomenal. Wow. It was it was like not ever seen before as a musician. And the, the, the weirdest part is it's it's pretty much reproducible. I mean, the first time <clears throat> that I would play at almost any facility, I almost get the same reaction. People started singing. They started dancing. 
Wow. One guy almost fell out of his wheelchair because he was trying to get up to dance with the ladies standing next to him. The nurses went crazy. They couldn't believe what was happening to the residents. And I was blown away. I mean, I had never, I, I mean, I played in bars. I'd see people react, they get excited, they dance, but never anything like this. And this was a room full of people in wheelchairs. And that was like totally depressed. You know, if, if you walk into a nursing home, if you have any idea what that's like, you know what I mean? It's not a happy yeah. place. No. And all of a sudden it was a party. So I started volunteering at that place uh, once a week. <clears throat> and then somebody through the grapevine, I don't know exactly who, somebody hired me to play piano for them while they went to sing at a, at a retirement home. And that's when I realized that these places had a budget because if she was going to pay me, then they were paying her and they were paying her for two people and, and for, she needed me, but I didn't need her. And uh, <laughs> So then I started playing and started out, you know, $35, $40 a gig. And, you know, that was in 93. Um, wow. But I loved it. I, I was still playing at the Mission Ranch, but then eventually I just left it uh, because to play in a nursing home in the afternoon and see that reaction and, and with, with those folks and then go into a bar and play for, you know, normal people in a bar on the yeah. it's a very <laughs> yeah. different experience and eventually you know because i did have learned to live cheap i could give up the the because the job at the mission ranch paid real good money but i didn't really care I, you know i was i played 30 or 40 gigs a month uh over that time right in the beginning and uh yeah no i was grateful to be able to do it Wow. And I know that they were grateful to have you doing that because this immediately brought me back to the documentary Alive Inside. Have you seen that? No. no. So I would love for you to watch it because you are the epitome of this documentary called Alive Inside, where this one researcher goes into nursing homes and retirement communities and well, particularly long-term care facilities where most of the individuals have dementia and Alzheimer's. And what uh, the researcher did is with the idea of using a little tiny iPod and finding out what the music was that the patient's listen to so the residents listen to growing up he downloaded their music onto the ipod and he shows up in the nursing home puts on the headphones and all of a sudden just like what happened when you started to play your music everybody like literally jumps out of their wheelchairs and this is what happened these people who were ca like catatonic and not moving not eating not doing anything all of a sudden literally just like come out of their entire bodies and start like dancing and singing. And then when the headphones come off, all of a sudden the person you watch them just all of a sudden shrink back up. Right. Yep. So you yep. see, and of course this documentary shows that the music, the area of the part that's a, the area of the brain that processes music and holds music memories doesn't get affected by dementia. No. And so I, that. I, I, I... Well, don't no, go with what you're going to say there. No, well, no, it's just I, I've seen it. I see it every. I would see it every show, and back then the dementia and Alzheimer's were usually mixed in with the general population. They didn't separate them. The way I mean, they may have. They started. I remember playing some of them that were separate, but a lot of them were all mixed in. So I would play for the general folks and also play for the Alzheimer's people, and it was really obvious that the Alzheimer's people would react like little kids. Mm. They would get excited. They would dance. They would sing. I've had people, <clears throat> you know, uh, that, uh, that would start singing where the nurses would go crazy because these people were nonverbal. They yeah. never spoke. And wow. all of a sudden they're singing, you are my sunshine. I had woman, one woman call out a request and the nurses almost, they, they couldn't believe it because she hadn't spoken in years. And it took me a while to figure out what she was saying because it was really muffled. But I finally figured out what song it was. As soon as I started to play it, she started to sing it. Wow. So 
that connection is, is like any musician that plays there will know it. The researchers have to go in and, and do academia to prove it. Yeah. But any musician that's ever done it knows it. Uh, that something different with the Alzheimer's folks where they make this connection. And I used to say it's what they fell in love to. You know, mm. when you're in high school and you're dancing and you fall in love, that song will always be with you. And exactly. That, and that general style of music for sure. But some songs are just magic. Oh yeah. Well, for me, I, after I watched that documentary and then hearing, you know, and you know, you watch a documentary and you're like, okay, that's, you know, it's going to be biased. Like all documentaries are going to be biased. They want to show the thing that they want you to see. And so when I saw this, I was like, okay, this is mind blowing. Why do we not have iPods? And like every resident should be given an iPod with music or an, and have music and record players and everything all throughout the facility, then if it's what brings them alive. And, and some of these people couldn't eat and they were starting to eat again. Some yeah. of these people couldn't remember their family members, but when they had the music playing and their family members came to visit, they could remember their family. They can recall all the memories. And yeah. so, but you are like living proof that that documentary is real. Like that's oh, the yeah. that right now oh, is yeah. landing for me so deeply. And what's mind blowing again is the fact that um, retirement homes are not built around music. It's it was I started I got I play, I worked on that soapbox for a long time, but what I I had the passion for it, but I don't have the, the I didn't have the communication and business skills to convince any of the powers that be whether you know it be like a. Uh, a private nursing home. I played a lot of them. And also the chains. I remember actually dealing with some corporate person in charge of activities and sending them videos and, and all this kind of stuff. And they were all excited, but it never went anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I never knew how to follow it through. I used to say every if they had a show every day, the whole place would change. Yes. It, it, the whole experience of being there for the staff residents would be different and if they just had a live show every day and then that's one hour and then the rest of the day they have all the recorded music that yeah. is available now because of the ipads and all that stuff yeah. but you know so every once in a while somebody will get it a friend of mine sent me an article in, in new yorker or something like that from new york and it, it was news guess what Alzheimer's and music is an impact, you yes. know, and I wrote a back saying I've known this for 25 years because yeah. I don't know whether they'll ever eat the food. I mean, the food they serve in these places is. Well, I just wrote that down. I wrote music, food and children. So here we have a daycare problem, right? And right. let's get the young children in with the people who the grandmas and grandpas and all of a sudden the, like the children come alive in a healthy way. The kids like the adults come alive in a healthy yeah. way. You know, it keeps them young. It makes the kids like it's just like we have it all backwards. We are separating right. the elderly, you know, who have the wisdom and the knowledge. So we're making anybody who's like what over the age of like 50 obsolete like they don't know anything let's tuck them away in a corner then we take away the music which is scientifically proven to not only benefit children like they should have music in the classrooms and they should have music in the retirement homes and then of course we land on the food but the one thing i want to say about the music is just talking to you again um and remembering that documentary alive inside i remember saying to everybody keep a list of all your favorite songs and that needs to go into your will and that needs right. to get put on a tripod <laughs> and then you go get when you get checked into your retirement home you have that with you so that it you don't go down you just go up and then you die like happy and dancing and singing and so I used to talk but I haven't done it yet but now talking to you I'm like that is my on my to-do list that I'm gonna go make that happen so you brought up the word food, but before we dive into the nutrition, because you have an incredible story, your like Amelia, your daughter has an amazing story of healing. You are healing yourself right now. We're going to get into that. But I just want to talk about this commune in Woodstock. What is all about that? <laughs> well, the commune wasn't in Woodstock. The commune in Ithaca, near Ithaca, New York, in, in, in near Cornell University. <clears throat> One year we were on the commune. The Woodstock was a group, was 
the commune. It was a, a shared home that was, uh, yeah, it, everybody there lived their own life, but we'd get together for dinner and have house meetings type things. So it was communal. And then yeah, we'd have everything. the Woods experience was a big house. And uh, so there was other families there with kids and uh, we were about five miles outside of Woodstock. And uh, yeah, you know, Amelia was about six and her sister about three, something around there, or six or seven. And uh, yeah, that was great. The, the commune was a real commune. And they started with uh, eight people. And then I was one of the uh, ad add-ons and there were a few other that came in there. So we wound up with about 10 or 12 for most of the time. And we were building log cabins and yurts in the, uh, and, and uh, like I said, in this 40 acres that he had, this one guy had and was, he basically, he was part of the commune and that was his gift. So, and we were just, uh, no electricity. We had to haul the water up from the stream. Wow. And, you know, growing the garden, we had goats, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And it was pretty amazing. That, that was great. And uh, that yes. fell apart because they, they couldn't live up to their dream. Mm. And um, it got overrun by a lot of people. And all of a sudden, it just it wasn't viable anymore. So that's why the next year, I went to Woodstock and found this house. And we were there for about six months. Wow. So you seem to have a lot of the recipes for healthy, sustainable living here. So, you know, commune living, we know that the research shows that living in a community is one of the most important factors for good health oh, yeah. and being alone and lonely and isolated in our individualized, like huge, big homes that are separated where we're cooking our dinner separately risk, massive risk factor for depression and lots of chronic diseases. Um, you were growing your own food. Of course, we know how important that is. You were building, so you're exercising your body by building cabins and putting up yurts and all of that, which again is one of the factors for good health is like not over-exercising in a gym, you know, or doing marathons, but literally like daily movement every single day, just through your day-to-day -day activities is also really important for health. So like you're, you're basically like the epitome of the blue zone um, research, right. That shows that we have to have all these factors in place so that we can have health that is free, you know, and health being free of chronic disease and free of these human made, um, illnesses that are the result of our lifestyle. So this is, I'm like, absolutely just devouring all of this. And I got to live in a commune as well. So I just wanted to share that with you. And right. it was the best. I lived there for almost a decade in my twenties. And it was just a huge house that had six different units, but it was this old colonial style house that had our front porches connected, our back porches connected. We had a community garden. And as everybody moved, as one person moved out, then we would invite our friends in until eventually the whole house was 12 of us all living together in this amazing house, all different ages. Like we had, you know, you know, someone was retired, somebody was just getting married and having babies, but we all collectively had the same values. So we ate together all the time. We cooked food together all the time. And I have to say a hundred percent, it was the best place to live. What happened is we all started moving out once we found our partners and started having children and just the design of the house probably wasn't conducive to that because, you know, you can hear babies crying and everything. But at the same time, I got to raise my little one there for the first year of her life. And I felt so nurtured as a mother, so mm. held. I never felt alone. There was always someone to comfort my baby if I couldn't, or if I was too tired or needed to do laundry or cook a meal. Like, you know, I never felt alone and it was the literally the best way to live. And what's so sad is that when we say the word commune, people get such a messed up idea of what that is. Right. Well, it, it a lot of bad press from back then. And well, <clears throat> it was Partly what the, the reason they talk about it is that the commune that I was on 
the reason it fell apart is that um, I was in my late 20s. I, I, I came there with, with the two girls. And most of them were, uh, there was one other woman that had a couple of kids. And that's why they, most of them back then wouldn't take family, wouldn't take kids. Mm -hmm. And I, that's what I was looking for was a commune that would take kids. And I looked at a couple and they wouldn't take kids. Then I found these folks and they did. Um, because she, she was, you know, <clears throat> girlfriend was one of the people that was running it. And so she wanted other kids to hang around, same as what I wanted, other mm -hmm. kids. So, but they were, most of them were like in, in their eyes and they were anarchists. Mm -hmm. And they really believed that anarchy was the way to go. Now, I would call myself very left-leaning, you know, I mean, I would say I was pretty much a hippie back then. Uh, but there were some things that were just too much. And so we had a lot of arguments about, it's not okay to, uh, back then it was uh, phone numbers. I forget what, you know, you got a, a number and then you could make phone calls for free. And so they thought this was just fine. And I said, no, it's stealing, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, you get a free phone call, but somebody's paying for it. Yeah. It's, that's not okay. You know, I mean, anarchy is you do what you want but you don't take from other people to do what you want. So yeah. I was never, I don't really understand what they mean. It's coming around again with the whole anarchy thing where they just want to do what they want. But I think that's why communes got a lot of bad press back then because they had a lot. I looked at some communes and stayed for five minutes because they were just disgusting. Yeah. Um, and that, but when you say commune, if fills in all of them. I've looked at others that were perfect. I mean, they were yeah. they wouldn't take kids, but everything was neat, clean, and they knew how to, how to live. They were doing a great job. Um, at one point, <clears throat> the, the word got out about our place to a lot of college kids, because we were right near Cornell. And over the uh, latter part of the summer, we got overrun by a lot of kids that wanted to come see the commune. But we didn't have any facilities so they didn't know what to do and so the anarchists that were running the commune had a big fire bonfire to talk about it and they had to tell people to leave mm. and that went against the whole anarchy model mm -hmm. and they never recovered from that i think philosophically it just tore them apart yeah. that they couldn't live what they thought was was true but they couldn't because the people were taking everything and not giving anything back. So we, we didn't have a on the stream. They were eating the food and we didn't have any to begin with. So that's why that fell apart. But it's part of why communes have a bad rap. Uh, it's just, there's a lot of variations. There's a lot of variations. And that's the problem when we label things and people aren't willing to know. Like, I always say this, you know, I, I was been teaching yoga for like over 20 years, maybe now. And people will say like, oh, I hate yoga. I had like that class was awful. And I was like, well, there's so many different styles of yoga. There's so many different styles of breath work. There's so many right. different styles of, you know, uh, communes. And it's because we label it, you know, as opposed to just calling yoga spiritual connection, breathing, movement, you know, stretching, I don't know, like strength building, like, but because we call it yoga, then people have this assumption. And I mean, when I started teaching, people would yell out the window and be like, go back to your country, you hippie, because they'd see this <laughs> yoga mat that I was carrying right. on my way to my class. Whereas, right. and same thing with the commune, if I tell people I lived in a commune, the first question I get asked was like, oh, so you must have just done a lot of drugs in your 20s. And I'm like, actually no we right. were all in university we were all working two jobs um we were you know because we're trying to save to buy a house and to do all these things we are saving for traveling we had huge massive parties but it was like thanksgiving dinner and christmas and halloween like but it was more to bring community together so like we'd invite the community to come eat with us and we cook together and so it wasn't about like getting drunk and high and like you know sex all over the place it was literally because our values around sustainable living and community were aligned and yeah. but how many people shut themselves off from having that experience when it's actually what they're craving right just because um, of a term, right? And so, 
Yeah. I just, I just think that's, it really speaks to who you are, that you wanted to also raise your children in that environment as well. Like if more parents, you know, had those values, um, that would be amazing. The other part about that is the part about the anarchist. And again, I've been called an anarchist because I've questioned our education system, the way it's designed. I've, you know, and I'm talking about our compulsory public school education system. I've questioned the food that we eat. Like, should we be eating non-organic foods full of pesticides and tons of these meat products? And I've questioned why alcohol is the drug that's legalized over other you know, herbal plants that are cleaner. I've questioned, you know, lots of different things, but just the act of questioning also then gave me the labels. Like even one of, you know, a college professor said, I think you're an anarchist, Nikki. And I'm like, really? I don't think I am. Because like you said, I do believe in making society better, but not from taking from others for myself, but us literally building, you know, a thriving environment together collectively that doesn't steal from other people. Whereas the entire system that we live in right now, is it not anarchy? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I don't think it's anarchy. It's, I don't know exactly what it is, but uh, uh, capitalism run amok. Um, yeah. It, 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 it's certainly not good. I mean, it, everything that you're talking about is true. It's unfortunate, but you know, that is the society that most people live in. Yeah. Yeah. I and the fact, look. oh, sorry, I interrupted you there. Go ahead. No, it's, I, it, you're always going to interrupt me. It's, it's, it, yeah. Okay. Now go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I, I see what, yeah, I know what you're saying. And this is the thing that, you know, I invite people as you're listening to Bob here talk about how his life has unfolded to just like question, um, you know, what are the decisions that you're making today in your life? And what are the systems that we need to question, you know, whether it's just questioning your own career, right? Just being like, do I want to be a chemical engineer or an accountant or a doctor or whatever your profession is right now? You know, I love that your heart is so big that your mind is equally just as big and that you're connecting the two to really just create a life for yourself where, you know, health is at the forefront. Um, so, I have a question for you. Let's dive into the food part now, because um, we touched on a little bit, the fact that in a lot of retirement homes, the food is awful, but also in a lot of hospitals, the food is awful. Oh. Um, but you're a musician, you love playing music and you hadn't been able to play music really for a while because you, what, you did you have arthritis in your hands? Well, I've been, I've been able to keep playing, but the arthritis, I didn't realize it was arthritis kicked in about um, April, I would guess, something around April. When I, I first came up to Seattle in March and, and I started playing at Pike's Market. Um, I think it was around April when I first started playing. And I played in, in, a, in a club at an open mic and something. And then my hand got really swollen, my right hand, which is what does most of the playing. When I'm playing melodic, I'm just using the right hand. Um, my left hand is, is still fine, but my right hand got really swollen and started to hurt. And I thought it was just uh, tendonitis. I've had that over the years. I, I slowed down my playing. It goes away. Uh, it wasn't going away. And I couldn't make a fist. I mean, I had my hand like this, and I could go maybe this far. You know, now I can make a fist, but boy, when it first started, I could only go to this part. And it was hurt. It was starting to hurt. So when I realized it wasn't going away, um, I went I went to see the doctor and I got an x-ray and it came back with arthritis and mm -hmm. the two middle, middle finger and second finger. And I started getting pains in the joints, really different kinds of pains that I'd never experienced before a sharp shooting pain right in the joint in the fingers um and my my very tender you know if i touch my hand it really hurt it was very tender so i had been eating pretty good what i considered good at the point a lot of rice and beans um uh, i threw broccoli in because i knew it was healthy but <laughs> it, it was just you know 
had anything. I mean, I would have just eaten rice and beans and throw in some salsa and I had a happy camper. And I considered that to be really healthy. Um, oh, a lot of bread, a lot of bagels and cream cheese, still considered that to be healthy. I mean, I hadn't gone to a Burger King in a long time and, and I stopped I never stopped, I hadn't stopped eating meat completely, but I've been off red meat for a long time and mostly just chicken and fish. But I was still eating chicken and fish when I could. Um, but I thought it was a pretty healthy diet, you know. And, you know, when this happened, uh, when the arthritis hit, I mean, Amelia, I forget, it's been six, eight months or so since she first did the Eat Real to Heal with the egg linker program. And that's where she started telling me about it. And <clears throat> we were exposed to the whole juicing thing. Uh, in the eighties, there was a, some guy I read and he was a real proponent of the uh, carrot juice and all that and fasting. And I remember trying that in the eighties but it didn't really hit. About 2000, a friend of mine got cancer and I came across this uh, doctor. I don't know if you know uh, Lorraine Day. Yes, uh, you do know her. I okay. do know her very well. So, yeah. So I read her read her book, and I and she was you know I don't think I don't remember whether it was based on Versa, but I knew it was a lot of characters. And um, my friend, he couldn't get, he couldn't deal with it. He just wasn't you know, he, and he passed away a while a little while later. Um, but I never thought of it for me at that point. Mm -hmm. It just was, it was like, well, if I ever get cancer, I'll think about it. Um, and then Amelia started telling me about this, where it's, you know, all veggies and all fruit. And, uh, thank God for the oatmeal. Uh, that, that's a good start for the day. And it takes the place of my bagel. So I'm good with that. Um, and she told me about her experience. And this was before I knew that I had arthritis. So it was like, okay, that sounds interesting. You know, but I still felt that I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. The arthritis is, is a perfect example of something bad turning into something good for me because I certainly would ne never wish to have arthritis in my right hand. I'll take it any place else in my body except my right hand. Um, because that's what I need to play. And, and if I had it in my knees, you know, or back or something, life would be uncomfortable, but I could still play. Mm. Um, so I get it in my right hand, which is just, for me, it's a game changer. And so it was probably about a month or six weeks ago or so that I started doing it religiously. It took me a while to stop with the bagel and coffee in the morning. I mean, I was doing the juicing, but I was also doing the, you know, the bread and the coffee and uh, every once in a while and, and <clears throat> fish and chips, you know, occasionally and all that kind of stuff. But I was moving towards it. When I actually got the arthritis diagnosis and I knew that it, it wasn't going to go away. This was either I had to do something or it was going to just get worse. And that's when I started doing it religiously. And... I still have some bread every once in a while, but it's baked every day at the at the French bakery. Good. So I, I figure that's, I know it's not 100%, but that's my guilty pleasure, <laughs> uh, you know, to, <clears throat> to do that. Uh, but I've been doing, uh, you know, I don't, it's not, I, I watched your thing and it's not according to what I do. I simplify everything, you know, but I, you know, I, I do the oatmeal in the morning, then carrot juice, then big bowl of soup, then carrot juice, then green juice, and then another meal. Mostly a lot of potatoes late, later and other veggies. And I just started throwing in a little rice. Yeah. You know, because it's been long enough and Amelia said it was okay. So <clears throat> just a little bit of rice and lentils nice. and, and with the soup. And... Fill in the gaps with uh, the bananas and oranges and, and apples. Amazing. And, well, I mean, and, and do you think you're starving? Because a lot of people think oh, if you're no. going to eat. 
<laughs> not at all. In fact, if anything, I'm, I'm not as hungry as I used to be. Um, and when I get hungry, a lot of times I just want to eat because it's it's a dopamine hit. It's a diversion. Yeah. And I like eating, you know, and, and so I actually, you know, I mean, the food that I'm making tastes great. And in the first couple of times, when I, oh, I had some seasoning that I got from the, uh, the herbs here and I was throwing them in because I thought they were OK. And then I read the label and I saw some of them were OK and some of them weren't on the list. So I just stopped using them. Um, and it doesn't. I mean, it, it's it's not a it's not a, I don't consider it a hardship. I'm not hungry. Uh, you know, I mean, there are times where I'd like to just go out and get fish and chips and all that yeah. for, but I know that that's more for the the hit of getting the food that I like and that I, you know, live, you know, always wanted, never had enough of, so that's why it was always something that I always wanted. But even, you know, the bagels and, and stuff and free cheese and all that, uh, it's like, for me, that's why the, the bad is good type thing. The arthritis was like, it's not something I want to take a chance on. And yeah. it's like, well, maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. Uh, I know that I'm healthier. If it doesn't work, at least I tried. Mm -hmm. um, and if, it, if any, my hands continues to get better, um, whether it'll ever get to the point where it's not noticeable that something is different between the right and left. I don't really care about that. If it never got worse than it is now, I'd be fine. Right. And I can still play. I don't know. I'm, I can play about an hour. Well, I'm playing about 40 minutes to the time now. When I get up to an hour, then I can start doing shows again. And, but I don't want to push it because I don't have to right now. So I'm just kind of taking it slow. And it's not hard for me at all. Uh, I don't know exactly why, because I like to eat, and I used to like to go get sandwiches and and everything that everybody likes to eat, except steaks. Other than that, you know, I mean, barbecue chicken, I, I would love it, you know. But not having it isn't that big of a hardship, whereas having it it means I'm going to my arthritis is going to get worse. It's not worth it. Yeah. So for me, I've got the incentive. I know it, it, talking about people like with diabetes and stuff like that, I would think that would be an incentive. I don't know what that's like, but I, I've heard enough about it to know that it's probably not very much fun. Oh. Um, so, you know, I don't know what it takes. I know what it took for me to make the switch. And that, you know, was something near and dear to my heart that I needed. Um, but once I decided to do it, it just hasn't been tough. It, I mean, the juices are great. And uh, even the green juice tastes good. Mm -hmm. Throw a little apple and everything tastes good. Oh, yeah. And, you know, yeah. I mean, I was doing the carrot juice without the apple. And then Amelia told me to add the apple. And it's like, whoa, this is like a whole other ball. I mean, it's, it's delicious. So, I mean, I pretty much look forward to what I'm going to eat. And I'm eating, you know, six times a day. You know, between the juice and the meat. and then uh, apples, oranges, and bananas in between, and I'm a happy camper. I love that. Thank you for sharing your experience with us, because for a lot of people who are hearing this the first time, you know, you know, you're somebody who grew food. A lot of people in the states have never grown food a day in their life, and a lot of people who would come to our wellness center had never held an actual potato in their hand or a leek or a cucumber, or like they've just never seen a whole food before. They're just so used to eating only out of boxes and so fresh food. So you already had that. You're already somebody who thinks big about the planet, um, about, you know, wellness, obviously. And and so you had a lot of stepping stones leading you up to this path to, to say, yes. Yeah. So for a lot of our listeners, they're like, what, how can you just eat oatmeal and like soup? And, um, but I also want to let people know um, when you do this program, there's 350,000 plant species on the planet that you could eat. Right. And in some places, especially in Canada, because we're so much further up north, we don't get we don't get like 10 different varieties of tomatoes that you might get in Oregon. I went to this amazing grocery store in Seaside and I couldn't believe it. There were like 
10 different types of tomatoes, all different colors from black all the way down to like purple to red and different shapes. And they're like all heirloom and organic. Like I'd never seen that diversity of right. tomatoes and broccoli and cauliflower. So depending on where you are in the world, you're going to have more access to the diversity of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and whole beans and lentils that are out there, um, you know, than some other people. But so you do have access to lots of different things. So it's not about limiting what you're eating. It's actually bringing in way more than what you were ever exposed to before, right? Most people no. are eating five no. ingredients. They're eating processed wheat, processed corn products, which make up 95% of all food products that are in a box. And they're eating salt. So they're not getting their diversity of magnesium, calcium, phosphorus, potassium that is prevalent in all the vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans and everything. And they're getting um, sugar. So refined sugar, they're not getting the abundant diversity of sugars that are in all these foods that you talked about eating. And so they're eating really these four to five things. And then of course, MSG and yeast is the other thing that's added to food to make it taste like really, really good. So that's the diversity that 95% of people in the US are exposed to, and not just US, but Canada as well. So what you've done is just flipped it on its head and said, okay, well, I'm just going to only eat these real foods and occasionally a homemade loaf of bread from the bakery, right? So you can have the homemade without it being a guilty pleasure. Like, it's just like, oh, good. Yes. So, <laughs> right? Made my day. Exactly. And so because 95% of what you're eating is nutrient dense food, and you talked about um, you know, not being hungry. Well, we don't get hungry when all our nutritional needs are being met. We're only hungry when they're not being met met because we're eating these high caloric foods, but that don't have any nutrients and fiber. So your body, you're constantly searching for food, like fish and chicken and red meat don't have fiber right. and your body's craving fiber. So then if, even if you ate a 24 ounce steak, you're still going to be hungry afterwards because your body's looking for fiber and nutrients. Yep. And so you've turned that on its head. So are you doing, thank you. So I just want to say, thank you for bringing all of those points up because it's so important. One of the big important things that you said is the fact that your motivator was not being able to play music. And I think that's really important. Some people get the arthritis and they think there's nothing you can do about it because they haven't heard about eat real to heal or using food as medicine. So they get the arthritis. That's their first messenger that comes and, or, you know, or it could be like chronic migraines or it could be foggy brain. Like everybody's got a messenger that comes to them and, um, and tells them, Hey, something's not right in the body. But usually it, like you said, if you had the arthritis in the back, it wouldn't have motivated you. It, and, it would have been an incentive, but not nearly the same. I mean, right. you know, I've, I've had aches and pains for a long time, but I don't go to the gym, which I know would be better or yeah. even anything. Like you said, it could be the gym. I'm not really an exercise guy. I know that my, you know, I only walk when my back is really bad and walking will make it better. So I don't know that anything else would have been enough of incentive for me um, yeah. to, you know, to, to you know, it, it, it was less drastic than it, as far as the change goes, because Amelia has been telling me this for a while and I've been sort of making the change. Um, but I don't know that I ever could have gone over as, you know, pretty much 95% of throwing the, you know, the half a loaf of bread from the bakery. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but other than that, it's pretty much all organic, you know, uh, from the, the local organic food store. I mean, live in the market and they got fruits and vegetables, but none of them are organic. I was really yeah. disappointed. So I got to walk a quarter of a mile or so, which is fine. I'm happy. Which is probably good. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. In fact, I was getting Instacart for a while and I realized, no, I need to walk to the store and walk back. I need the exercise. Yeah. So it is good. You know, no, I'm, that... I'm, you know, I'm grateful it's there. Yeah, no, that is amazing. The other part too, that you mentioned, um, because a lot of people think when you do the Gerson therapy or the Eat Real to Heal program, the first thing they see is the juicing. So they think it's a juice cleanse. And I'm like, no, it is not a juice cleanse. The food is there and that is the medicine. 
the juicing comes in to give you the live enzymes that get destroyed by the heat and to give you the extra nutrients that you just couldn't consume that much food in a day. So to go from a place where you have symptoms like, you know, pains in the body and arthritis and brain fog, and to get you out of that hump just to get you to a baseline. So this is not having unlimited energy. This is not like reversing the arthritis. So your fingers are like supple again, but just to get you to that you can't get there without the extra nutrients that we've been missing for so many years. So then the juicing is it's an important second factor, but the food is the first and you can't do it without the food. You need that fiber that's in there. Juicing doesn't give you the fiber. So then, but you get enough fiber from the food. So no worries. Then the third part. So I'm really curious about this. Are you doing the supplements? Yeah. Well, I'm doing two vitamins. Yeah. I'm but the supplements the from the old, like from the Eat Real program, Eat Real to Heal program, are your own supplements? No, this is what you know. Amelia told me they're just uh, uh, multivitamins. That's all I'm doing right now. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's just a multivitamin. You know, that's that's got. I think she said it. it it's like you know part of the recommendation and so forth. But okay. it, you know, it's got a lot of the stuff in there that you want us to have. Okay. Good. So what I want to do is I just want to offer this to you because I would love for you to reverse your th arthritis permanently, and which, yeah. Okay. So you can do this. I'm telling you, it's all my clients that have ever had arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, even when their fingers are locked in place because of the excessive, um, you know, overgrowth and calcification in their knuckles, and they can't even stretch out their hands all of a sudden they get it all back because the body will go in and dissolve all that excess um, sediment, we'll call it, that gets right. built up, right? And it's just chronic inflammation. So your body goes in there to try and heal the chronic inflammation and it's putting deposits of excess in there that we don't need. And so then more, your immune system comes in to then fight that excess of deposits. And then so it builds up even, so it's just chronic inflammation and this can be fully reversed. And so- and it's amazing when it happens, like synovial fluid in your joints will come back. And so, but the way to get to that, because we can go from the food, which will kind of stop the progression of the disease and get you for sure experiencing less symptoms to adding the juicing, which then gets you to like a normalized place. Then to get to the place of chronic disease reversal, we have to have those missing nutrients that you just can't get through your food and your juicing because it doesn't exist in the produce. Okay. And so that's where the supplements come in. So then we do this and all of a sudden it's like your healing goes like this. So then the last part of the program that I'm curious about, are you doing the coffee enemas? No, that's, uh, are you... what's that? No, I, I, yeah, I live in a, I don't have a private bathroom. Okay. So that's been kind of the. Right. You know, it, yeah. it would be difficult. I, I don't know if it's possible, but it definitely be difficult. Right. So this is just one of the elements where I say um, this is the last part of the therapy and where the healing really comes in because as your body is neutrifying and repairing the damaged cells that stopped the body from then absorbing nutrients and eliminating waste, waste builds up in the body. And I'm not just talking about environmental waste that's out there getting in and it is there getting in through our food soil like lack of nutrients in the soil water everything so yes we have environmental pollutants but we also have our own body that's breaking down every day as the cells die you know this from chemistry right 100 every 120 or 120 days our red blood cells die right. and a new one right. is replaced right every so same thing with our intestinal lining our liver like every cell in the body is being born again and dying. So what happens to the death, like to those cells that are dead, they have to get out of the body. So the body absorbs and breaks them down. That's our own metabolic waste, including like just breathing out through our lungs, right? Which those are two of major massive detoxifying organs, our skin. So we got to heal the detoxification pathways as well. So, but we got to support the organs in doing that. So we don't want to flood our, as our tissues heal all of that waste ends up in our bloodstream, which gets filtered out by our liver and kidneys and lungs and skin. So we don't want to burden the body and just keep recirculating 
any of this metabolic waste and environmental waste. So it's really important. That last piece is the liver detox. So we don't burden the liver. So what I say to people, if you have roommates or if you're sharing a bathroom, you just tell them like, Hey, listen, it's really important for me to get healthy. Music is my life. And if I don't have music, then what else? Like, you know, so I need to reverse this. Um, it's going to take me in your case for arthritis. It's actually just a few more weeks for you. If you are doing this whole therapy, um, you can reverse arthritis in less than three months fully. Um, and, and so then you tell them, I'm just going to hang a note on the bathroom door that says coffee break. And you just are respectful. You keep the place clean. It's in the comfort of your own home. No problem. So for most people that I teach this to, and I've taught this to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands, actually, um, you know, you just make it fun and light and then you start doing it. So I share that for our audience because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm never going to do that. And no, I understand that feeling. <laughs> Yes. yes. You're yes. like, and, or I'm never putting anything up there. Like things are no. supposed to come out, not go back in. But when you learn the science of it and why it's really important, especially in a world where we have 80,000 chemicals a year entering into our body every single year, you want to do this. No. So anyway, so I offer that as like a free coaching online. So all our listeners can hear. Um, so I thank you for giving me that opportunity. Um, so something, and I want to work with you as well. If you would like to, I'm offering this to you free of charge that let's reverse your arthritis. Um, just because you've already been such an inspiration for so many people, let's just take it up that next level. If you want, if you want so, well, on the back to the supplement thing, it's, yeah. so what, what are the supplements that I should be? I mean, I guess I could just check the website. Yeah. It's and I of... will walk you through all of that. So um, what I'll do for teaching purposes on this podcast right now, if that's okay. So um, Dr. Max Gerson, he intensely studied individuals with cancer and chronic disease for decades and decades. And what he saw is that they were very nutrient deficient. Um, and so he replaced those first with food and juicing. And then the ones he couldn't replace with the food he had to introduce in the supplement form, but they're not the supplements that you can just go out to the health food store and buy off the health on the shelf. First of all, those are so expensive and you'd have to take the whole bottle to be able to get the dose. So they're very therapeutic dosing of really like their pharmaceutical grade supplements. So, and they, and a lot of people, what they don't realize is that, um, supplements are compounded. Like you can't just go and take potassium. Like you'd be consuming a rock, like this big, thick rock right. um, of potassium. It has to be compounded with other things. So what it gets compounded with is critical. So a lot of people, when they hear, and I'm, so I'm very um, conservative here on the podcast, when I start to talk about supplements, because I don't want everybody going to the health food store and just buying things off the shelf because they don't understand chemistry. So you can take, for example, magnesium chloride, magnesium citrate, magnesium um, glyconate. There's so many different types or magnesium biglycanate. There's so many different types um, of compounding um, minerals and, uh, and compounds that are used. So Dr. Gerson studied the supplements extensively so that he knew the exact compound. So when you take iodine, it's not just any iodine on the shelf, it's iodine, water, and potassium iodide together that have to be mixed in a certain ratio. So again, how much chloride are you going to put with the magnesium will also determine that effects on your health. So he didn't want people taking, taking magnesium chloride, but a lot of the supplements on the shelf are magnesium chloride and the byproduct when it breaks down in your body ends up being toxic versus when you take the potassium compound that is recommended. Okay. So that's the first thing to understand. Um, and I'm not, I'm, as I'm speaking to you, Bob, I'm speaking to the whole world right now. Who's no, it's okay. to this. I, this is I, not my area of expertise. I'm over. Yeah. So, so um, thanks for letting us use this podcast as an opportunity to teach. So, so you need to have high dose potassium and it's not just taking one or two pills a day. You'd actually take up to 18 teaspoons of a potassium solution every time you have a juice in your water throughout the day on the full therapy. So for you, if you're taking three juices a day, you'd add that to your juices and you take it. The potassium is critical because we're reversing our potassium sodium imbalance is what we're doing. And we have to do that. It could take up to a year and a half to fully reverse it because we live in a society where guess what? 
multiple mis- multiple types of sodium are used as preservatives in our food. So now to reverse that imbalance in our cells and our extracellular fluid, we have to take high dose potassium. And again, it's got to be the right compound. Another one of the supplements is iodine. It's critical for stopping cancer cells in their tracks. So it creates cellular apoptosis. It helps with anti-angiogenesis, which is cancer has this amazing way, but not just cancer, any disease. When we have a disease where there's chronic inflammation, our body wants to grow blood vessels to that area. And we don't want excess blood cell growth, especially being dictated by cancerous cells. So iodine is responsible for your brain health. It's responsible for everything. So that's the second thing I want people to know about supplements we have this idea that eat carrots because carrots are good for your eyes. Okay. No, it doesn't work that way. Every food on the planet all contains predominantly all the same minerals, nutrients, vitamins, sometimes in higher quantity, sometimes in lesser quantity, but it's not just carrots that provide you with beta carotene, like anything that's of like orangey color provides you with that. So stop thinking in this uh, reductionist mindset, right? Like for people who are listening, you got to stop saying, well, I eat carrots because it's good for my eyes. No, you eat carrots and drink carrot apple juice because it's good for your entire body. Apples are good for you because they also have pectin and malic acid, but also 125 other minerals, nutrients, and vitamins that we need. Okay. So, so I want people to think about that. You're not just taking potassium for one thing. You're not just taking iodine for one thing. The other supplements in the protocol are really important because they help with your digestion. So all that food that you're eating is so great, but you can actually extract even more nutrients by a particular having enough hydrochloric acid that breaks down the food so that your body can get more nutrients. So there's, you know, that, that we're helping your digestive system. We're helping your cellular system. We're helping your pancreas as well with pancreatic enzymes. We're helping your liver with liver enzymes. So we never treat just one organ or one system in the body. We treat the whole entire thing. So CoQ10 is really, really important. Now, Dr. Gerson's never wanted us to be consuming supplements ever if we didn't have to. So we only take these supplements until we're fully healed. So when your arthritis is gone, your heart is awesome. Your cholesterol is normalized. Blood pressure is perfect. You don't have brain fog. Um, If you have any tumors in the body, they're shrunk and gone, you know, so your body is optimal. Well, then we really only need to take a couple supplements that we can't get through food. You know, so your vitamin D is really important, even though that's not part of the protocol, um, vitamin D, vitamin B12, and then probably a drop of iodine a day and potassium. And that's your, that's what you would do for the rest of your life. And how cool would that be to only have four supplements in your entire cupboard? Right. So anyway, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, um, share these details online. Cause I never really get this opportunity. Uh, you have to sign up for one of my courses to get access to what I just said. Um, so I think this was just really great. So, so that would be it. So you, after this is all over, you're going to show me what you're taking. We can adjust that. And then what we want to see is your fingers. Like you'll feel like a 25 year old again. Oh, okay. If you were, if you were healthy at 25. <laughs> uh, well, my, my hands were fine at 25. Yeah, I guess I was healthy. Okay, great. So then we can get you back to you to having that. And we know that diagnostically, because I have clients that are in their sixties and seventies that have polyps, precancerous cancer, colon cancer, and they've had colonoscopies and their colonoscopies are awful. Like it looks like death inside of them. Their colon looks like death. And then Three months later, they go back for a follow-up colonoscopy and the doctor will say, oh my goodness, your colon looks like that of like a young, healthy, fit 25-year-old person, right? Not the party animal that's doing drugs and drinking in university, but the healthy one. Right. (laughs) Yes. So so we see this diagnostically how it works. So yeah, I'm I'm here to support you um, in continuing to play music for people everywhere, busking at you know, Pike market in the retirement homes, all of that, the work you're doing is so incredible that we got to keep you super fit and healthy for that, which is awesome. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about, uh, stoicism. Unless, unless you have any questions for me about the therapy, because if you don't mind us using this as like part learning 
as we're talking, then great. You can go ahead and ask me anything you want, but. No, I, I you know, I, 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 I've got a connection as they say. So I, you know, I, I, I have my, my go-to person. So you, we can talk about whatever you want. Awesome. I know Amelia will fill me in. Yeah, exactly. I love that. Um, another part about this story that I, in just in case, you know, people didn't quite pick up on that. The fact that Amelia started this program through a company called A-Linker and A-Linker was founded by B and B is this incredible human who created a bike for mo people with mobility challenges. Um, and it helps them get out of the wheelchair onto a bike so they can actually move around, but it actually creates neural pathways and does all of this. So, you, so your daughter, Amelia was part of the A-Linker community. We partnered with the A-Linker community to then see what would happen if we said, well, let's teach food as medicine, the Eat Real to Heal program to the A-Linker community. And it's just been phenomenal what happened. But Amelia, like for people who are listening, like she suffered um, from hyperthyroidism since 2003. She had a massive goiter on her neck, in her neck. Um, you know, her thyroid was severely inflamed. I could see the thyroid, like her goiter. She used to cover it up with a scarf. And now her goiter is basically like almost gone. Like you could barely, you can see the vertical lines in her neck as opposed to the horizontal lines from having the goiter there. So in Amelia, um, her energy came back, everything. And then she's now working for us pretty much full time, which is just incredible. So one thing I just have to say to you, Bob, in, us, in me sharing that story, a lot of family members do not listen to their daughters or their children. And I just think it's really incredible that you have such a beautiful relationship with Amelia and that you actually just went and said, okay, I'm willing to learn this and do it. Whereas a lot of other parents out there, and I see this all the time, my clients try and get their parents to change their lifestyle. And you're 79 years old, you know, and people say like, oh, I can't change. I'm too old to change. But like, you're so young, like you could live for another 21 more years, like, or more even past a hundred. No, who knows? No. Who knows, but I just have to acknowledge that, that you are again, this beautiful, rare individual who's not too proud or egotistical, or like, I know better than my children that you actually were willing to learn from her. So I oh, just want to, yeah, well, especially when it comes to food. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just think that is very beautiful. So can we ju jump into um, stoicism? Because uh, this is, I actually didn't know the term until a couple of years ago. I used to, people used to say, oh, that's a stoic individual. I didn't know what that meant. And now I just discovered like Marcus Aurelius and all of this, you know, beautiful literature that goes back for centuries. Um, so when, when for you, did you enter this beautiful world of um, stoic literature and reading and recently philosophy. actually I mean what I, I, I always think is, is new for me um, I mean I was used to the uh, meditations by Marcus Aurelius a while back um, and I remember reading a, a version of it and it didn't really I mean I, I liked it but it, it didn't really resonate the way um, and then I came across uh, a trans uh, by somebody that I knew. Uh, I studied, uh, read a lot of Gurdjieff. Uh, he was a uh, Armenian, Russian. Nobody really knows where he was born. So there, but he taught in the twenties in Russia through the forties to. I think he died in forty nine and wound up in France. Um, so a lot of my reading has been uh, with the, uh, the I Ching, uh, Krishna. I lived in OI for eight years and got to speak. Um, so it's kind of a, a conglomeration. Uh-oh, we lost the internet unstable. Now it's back. Uh, that might be me. I, I, I'm on Nord, so it, it's a VPN kind of thing. I hadn't thought about that. Anyway, one of the people that I knew from my time with the Gurdjieff groups uh, is a professor in, in San Francisco, and I saw that he did one of the translation meditations, and I read it, 
And I was pretty blown away by, now, of course, I know that his background is very tied in with Gurdjieff and his philosophy, but it's basically the same philosophy. I mean, it's just they're using different words to teach the same things. Uh, same way with Buddhism, I think it's the same, mm -hmm. same concept. You know, the world outside is not what makes you happy. It's the thoughts in your head that determine whether you're going to have a, a good life. And you control what you can control is your thoughts in your head. You can't control what happens to you in the outside world. And I mean, <clears throat> we talked about what's bad can turn out to be what's really good. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's funny, I've come a, a full circle around that. But in 2015, um, I went to New York and I was playing the Hammer Dolson at that point. I've been playing at Pike's Market for a couple of years. And it was, it's, it's a Hammer Dulcimer that was tuned like a piano. So it was something I, when I walked into the store, I saw it, I was able to just play it because it was intuitive, like a piano. Whereas most Hammer Dulcimers are tuned in very different type of tuning for Celtic music and mountain music. So I saw this, I was able to buy it. I started playing it. And then I got a bigger version and I went to New York and I in, in Central Park over the Columbus Day weekend around this time of year, 2015. Um, I played weekend. I had three or four great days, met amazing people. I met a couple that actually knew the Beatles, went to the high school with them. Um, wow. So, I mean, yeah, that was, kind of, they, they were quite by accident. I mean, I only talked to them for a couple minutes, but uh, it was that kind of, magical weekend and then on tuesday i went to the opera which is why i went to the new york to see the opera and on the morning my hammer dulcimer was stolen along with the keyboard that i have i went what? to buy tickets for the opera at 10 30 because i liked it so much i wanted to buy him again and i came back and somebody broke into my van and stole my hammer dulcimer Aww. so all of a sudden I remember sitting there waiting for the cop to come by to get the report. And I, you know, I've been studying this long for stuff for a long time. So I wasn't really freaked out about it. It was just kind of like, oh, well. <clears throat> but all of a sudden I was stuck in New York with no means of money. And all I had with me was a melodica. Actually, I can, I have one here that I'm gonna just. Okay. And this is just a, I considered it light. I never thought of it as a real instrument, but it's all I had. So I started playing it in the subways and at the uh, zoo in Central Park. And two things happened. First thing was that people loved it and they, they were typically good. And the second thing was I was having a ball. And when I tell people about it is before I did it, if somebody had said to me, pay you to sit there and, and just play melodies on the melodica, I would have said no, unless I was broke. I mean, if I absolutely needed the money, I would have said yes. Um, but it would have had, I would have had been desperate to do something like that. And yet once I was kind of forced into it because my instrument was stolen, I loved it. Basically, I've been playing it ever since. Wow. And and making really good, more money than I ever made before playing on the street, just sitting and playing melodica. Play anything from, you know, 20s and 30s music, you know, these Nirvana and Soundgarden. And it, it, it still amazes me when I talk about it. Wow. The reason I say full circle is because I've been the last couple of times I played this couple of weeks, I had played left handed. So I'm really able to pull it off playing melodies left handed because my right hand didn't work so good. I couldn't play the way I did. And, but I was able to play the melodies good enough. I couldn't pull off all the licks and tricks that I can with the right hand. Um, well, the connection was unstable, but I guess it's stable. See, it's, it's coming so, through. Okay, yeah. Okay, so then I, I, when I'm playing the melodica, that's what I've been doing pretty much for you know since 2015. Wow. 
Wow. And it's been amazing. I mean, wherever I go, it's, it's, it's I just sit down and make music and people love it. And I never would have done that. Like I said, wow. in a million years, I, the, the melodica that I had was given to me by somebody who, uh, it was her husband's and, and she didn't know what to do with it. So she gave it to me and I pulled on to it. Uh, never think in a million years that I would use it as a real instrument. Wow. And uh, yeah. So that is a that's a powerful story. Um, and it definitely is a good place to, you know, tie. I mean, there's so many actually, no, we can't. There's one more piece that I need to get into. But I love that because before we started recording the show, I said, Bob, I said, like, let's project to the future. It's your deathbed. You're lying in it. You know, this is a practice, a stoic practice of, you know, memento mori where you just like know every single day could be your last day, but like, let's project into the future. You've, you've hit a hundred, you've got this plaque from the community for making it to a hundred, you know, what is the one thing that you wanted to share with people? And it is exactly that when bad things happen to you, it's not really a bad thing. And that story is like pure evidence of that. And I'm sure you have a million stories like that as well. Oh, I got it. I mean, this, the arthritis is another one. I mean, I may live to hundred, uh, I probably wouldn't have if I kept eating the bagels and fish and chips and, you know, I, I never drank that, but I drink it once in a while. Um, but uh, I never would have been this drastic on my diet, never would have thought about doing this like this if it wasn't for the arthritis. And actually, I mean, that's not the first time when I look back at life, the cases where what I thought was really bad, and that's the stoic concept it's not what happens outside it's what your thoughts are about it that, that make it either good or bad and uh, it's it's powerful because once you let go of the idea that you know what's going to be good or bad you don't have to depend on something going the way you think it should you know everybody wants to get what they want without realizing if they get what they want, it might not actually turn out so good, but if they get what they want, it might actually be better. I'm only a piano player now. I wasn't good enough as an engineer to make a living at a hard time. Yeah. Engineers didn't go out of business, yet, you know, but uh, just in business because it really was something I wanted to do anyway. I mean, I, I liked it. I wanted to save the plan. But I was much sitting down in music than be, you know, talking to people about waste heat recovery. Um, but I run it on myself. I was making a lot of money and everything was good. So why would I change? Yeah. But all of a sudden I wasn't making any money and I had to change. So it, it's one of the most important things I think about is that you just don't when it, something bad happens, you just have to take the stoic view. It's like, well, we'll see what happens. Yeah. And I mean, there are plenty of bad things that turn out to be bad. Uh, you just don't like from the start. I didn't know about that exercise. I don't remember reading that on the, uh, but I liked it when you brought it up about, you know, imagine you're on your deathbed. What are you going to think? It's a good, good exercise. Yeah. And it's a lot of people carry coins in their pocket or they carry a memento mori, um, you know, symbol on their necklace that says memento mori. And it's just, again, to remind them that all of this can be gone. So how do you want to live your life? You know, today, right. tomorrow, the next day, like, do you want to be a kind person? Like, do you want to be somebody who gives back? Do you want to eat well and be, you know, liberated from your chronic diseases? Or do you want to, you know, in and your experience about, you know, the market changing, entering into recession, your career is over, that for a lot of people could have brought them into mass depression, even suicide, because they can't support their families anymore. They think they can't, right? It's not the truth that you can't, it's that you think you can't. And right. that brings you back to exactly what you said. It's our thoughts inside that really dictate our happiness. Um, and and it's not, the thoughts are not a byproduct. It's an action that we have to, you know, take every single day is to recognize our thoughts, first of all, and then recognize when they're not serving us 
and then take the action to also say, okay, like I'm going to change this. I'm going to choose to look at this recession and the loss of my job as being good, even though right now it is awful, right? It's to be like, it's not, this is not blind hope. This is not like, you know, putting, pulling the wool over our eyes. It's just saying like, right now I don't, okay, it feels terrible, but I believe that this will be serving me in the long run or the short term. I love that. So this last piece that I wanted that, that, I mean, yeah, you are in just an incredible teacher. They are so inspiring. Your knowledge is so profound and endless. And then, which brings me back to the fact that you're also a visionary. And Amelia was telling me that something you two are chatting about is what would it look like to have the, to have retirement homes, to having long-term care facilities? What would it look like to have these places, but where they actually have healthy food in their systems? Oh, we've been talking about this. Well, Amelia has played in the nursing homes also. I, I don't know if she told me that, but she did it for years. Uh, um, would trade stories about what was going. We've done a few gigs together, but most of them are our own. And it might, when you mentioned the, the, the kid, I mean, one of the things I learned quick in the retirement, I mean, the nursing homes are working and the retirement homes are a whole different thing. So nursing homes, you've got a lot of, you know, I want to say pain, in the, but it's hard liberties folks that wind up there, they didn't choose it in their hard time. So anything that you can do to make life a little bit better would make your life a million times better. The music would would also do that. And there are probably other things that other people think are good, and there probably are. Uh, homes are different because these people, uh, they were sold a story that when you get to a certain age, then it's really good to stop working and you want to just live your life out in leisure. So once a month, I'd go to these places and people would say things to me like, God, thank God you're here. You've been alive in this place up. Everybody around here is so dead because they're bored to tears. They have sold this story that like, this is one in life and then they get it. And they don't know what to do with themselves. All the women, they're used to cooking every day and having a kitchen. They don't cook anymore. So they don't. My mother lived through this. Well, I'm not going to cook. I can go down there and get food. But then she was miserable because she wasn't cooking. Yeah. All the guys had workshops. They had projects. They had their do list. You know, they had stuff to do. Now they got nothing to do. You know, if there's something to do, they can. If there's something to do, some people love to play golf every day, but most people get bored eventually. Then you got all these kids that need help, you know, care and all this stuff. So you got a bunch of adults that have nothing to do and are bored to death. And right next door, a school and a, and a nursery school or a care center where you got all these running around and not, not enough people care of them. So it seemed obvious. I mean, I've heard this. People try have tried to put it together in different places. I think there's a place in Norwegian that is that they were doing it. It's not rocket science. No. It's pretty obvious. You got a lot of groups of people that are completely alone and alienated, even when they live in a in a home like a retirement home. So if you add the nurse, <clears throat> when you have the folks in the nursing home and the folks in the retirement home, the folks in the retirement home will not go to the nursing home. They just, they don't want to walk through those doors and see those people because they know that's their future. So they just don't want to, I mean, I'll be, there's always exceptions, but that the rule is they don't want to mix. And yet mixing is good for everybody. It's, it's just the idea of having a community where you go from the kids to the adults to, to the grandparents. And then as you get sick ill or infirm in some way there's a place to take care of you without shipping you off somewhere it's just like a village i mean this is yeah. like full circle going back to where we started yeah. where everybody just takes care of others so we are pretty far from it but 
Oh, I, I know that you, you know, you've experienced it. I've experienced it just for a short time, not 10 years, but it, once you've done it, I mean, the, when I think about my music and playing, I always go back to the time on the commune because every night it was a fire and every night was music. Mm -hmm. And I played guitar. Every night I had a gig and I'd sit there and play and people would sing and they'd bang on stuff and make make rhythm and noise. But that that was like it was never anything else. And I've tried, always try to get that experience where that's where I live, where you play music. There's no reason not to. And if you do it during the day, that's even better. Um, but the concept of, of putting the various groups together. It's, it's just it, you know i mean that's kind of the concept of utopia that that would be and, and then the real work would start because yes the communes are not easy i mean yeah. you're, you're dealing with people and uh it, it, it's but at least you'd have that that concept of working together and you know for the good of everybody that's there you know exactly you know, all the all the platitudes but their platitudes for reason. Yes. Yeah. No. And you said, and you said it well, it is not easy, but I do believe that if we get together and creatively think about how we can put this together so that the, you know, the retirement home of the future, the nursing home of the future includes people if they want to cook, they should be able to cook. Like let's let them into the kitchen and chop vegetables. Because if you took cooking and gardening away from my mom, her soul would die. Right. Right. If you, and if you take her grandchildren away, her soul would die. Um, and so she needs those things. And those are the things that keep us healthy. So we can get creative. And I do believe that, yes, even though it would be hard work, it is going to actually be less work than the way we are currently doing now. And oh. plus the way that it's working now is not working. So no. this system, I... this model does have to be scrapped. It's not even just to like make a few tweaks here and there. It's like, whole new system altogether, but we can do it because we are humans. We are creative. We are loving. We are kind. We are hopeful. We are visionaries. All of the things that you are, Bob, I know humanity is. And so I just want to thank you so much for sharing your stories and your wisdom and your time with me today on the show so that others can learn from you. Um, thank you for being here on the Eat Realty Hill podcast. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Oh, and we'll have you again because I would love to hear more stories from you. Oh, I got stories. Uh, you got stories. We all have stories, which is what That's I love. True. We're storytellers. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. A beautiful thing. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Eat Real to Heal podcast. As promised, wasn't Bob's show amazing? What an incredible human. Um, the fact that he, you know, raised his girls, he, you know, went above and beyond the norm to really try different things like living in an intentional community and to try the Eat Real to Heal program at 86 years of age and to get these results. I love it because it really shows that anybody at any age can reverse their chronic diseases. So if you have a family member that is suffering from arthritis, that is taking any medications for their arthritis, please let them know arthritis is fully reversible and get them to do our program, purchase it for them for Christmas, do it with them because chances are you're one of the 60% of the population that is living with a chronic disease. Maybe it's not arthritis, but perhaps you have diabetes, heart conditions, um, you know, a mental health condition, depression, panic attack, um, panic attack disorder. Um, you know, all of these conditions are reversible infertility, cancer, many, many types of cancers can be fully reversed. We just need to catch them in time. So please learn this information. We do not need to be participating and contributing to this epidemic. It is an epidemic of chronic disease that is upon us now. And they, all these diseases are reversible. So let's work together to educate each other, to share this knowledge, to help each other. Because once we liberate ourselves from our chronic diseases, just like Bob did, like Amelia did, like thousands of my clients have done, it is incredible what you get to do. You get to go out into this world and live out your divine purpose. And, you know, when you don't have the energy to do that, or if you're in chronic, chronic pain all the time, or if you have brain fog that just like doesn't 
allow you to think clearly, to be able to go out there and live the life um, to your fullest. Well, you know what? We are depriving other people of our unique gifts. So that's why I do this work. So you can be out there sharing your talents, your wisdom, your skills with the world so that we can collectively be helping our communities and our planets in healing. Thanks everyone for being here with me and stay tuned for the next podcast on the Eat Real to Heal show. Bye everyone. Bye.